Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Gypsy Poet Radio here on blogtalkradio.com front slash Gypsy Poet. I am the Gypsy Poet, and of course, with me is the wonderful, ever awesome wing gal, the one and only, the vivacious, the absolutely giggling and sparkling girl George. Yes, people, girl George, say it with me. Girl George, girl George, girl George. Oh, what a blast! And, of course, we are continuing this awesome series with Girl George talking to her, to her rock star friends and welcoming them to the DPR family. Please welcome with me, oh, what an awesome show this is, Dr. Hux, producer, along with Shel Silver. And, of course, Girl George's friend, Ron Helsing. Are you there, sir? Hello? Hi, I'm Ronnie. I'm, I'm here. I, I can hear you pretty well, George. I can't hear... Uh, your cohort over there, too. Well, right? talk louder, Sophie. Okay, Ron, <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen you in like 40 years. Shel Silverstein mm-hmm. came to see us at the Red Dog Saloon in Nashville in 1973. And after he seen us, he says, Oh, I haven't been so impressed by a group since i seen Elvis the first time. But you shouldn't be with Pete Drake, your producer, because he's too country. You should be with my producer, Ron Haskin, because he, he knows crazy people. <laughs> and well, freaks, <laughs> and he he handles Doctor Hook. So we broke broke with our producer. We went back to San Francisco, which is where we came from, and he he stuck us with you, and you threw us out on the road with Doctor Hook and the Medicine Show, and we were playing with Chuck oh, Berry yeah. and Stevie Wonder and all of that. that. That was amazing. How oh, how yeah. did Shell we, tell you about that? How do you yeah, how, what are you yeah. gonna say? We I found some freaks for you. We had a great, great time. I tell you the truth, uh, George, I mean, you put together, you know, you and Star, you put together that show and uh, turned Nashville upside down. It was unbelievable. You guys were so far ahead of your time. It was incredible. And it was a time in Nashville, of course, like you know, uh, that was a, an unbelievable time. There was so much talent in that town. And uh, and you had put together a thing that was uh quite spectacular, and that was the reason why <coughs> I took you guys out on the road with Dr. Hook, because it was a uh, combination of those two acts, uh, you guys and Hook, was absolutely fantastic. You know, we how, got, did, uh, how did uh, Shell tell you about us? Shell had told me about you, actually, this goes way back uh, to before uh, George and the Arizona Star, this goes way back to, uh, let me see now, probably 1969 or 70 in San Francisco when Shell took me to see you. You were performing, I think, at the Coffee Gallery in San Francisco, and that's where I first saw you. And uh, it wasn't Shell necessarily who told me later on who told me about, you know, George and the Arizona Star. It was the whole town was talking about George and the Arizona Star. I mean, that's basically... (laughs) That's basically how I found out. You know, I'm and Nashville, we were at the Red Dog Saloon. I don't think you ever seen us. He just sent us out there. We talked to you on the phone. You said, go into a recording studio and record you guys talking. So we went into a recording studio and Star and Jilch babbled and babbled and babbled. And I sent that to us. And I think you signed us without seeing us in Nashville. Is that, is that the way it happened? Yes, because and then I he just course. shipped us out there and you threw us on the road with Dr. Hook. <laughs> yeah, well, so it was pretty it's, much on show say so. That may very well be so. I'm trying to remember. But uh, the fun of that whole show was that you guys would come out in the middle of a Dr. Hook show, and it was what would happen is Ray, uh, you know, who had the one eye, he would he would start to sweat under that patch that he had, and he needed time in the middle of the show to be able to change it, right? And Dennis would usually uh, just sing a song by himself, but when we had you guys out there, what we did instead was to bring you out and while Ray was off stage, and you guys would do your thing, and the audience would love it, and then of course Ray would come back, and uh, and that's how that went down. And the band and backed did. us up, and the drummer Jay was on drums, and Jay would get off his drums, and he'd be drumming on the stage, and they'd just go all crazy, and Sir would be eating a banana and throw that out at the audience, <laughs> and, and then at the end I'd take my sword off and I'd throw it across the stage, and I'd go flying across the stage, and and the roadie on the other side would catch it and then I would take a flip 
I'd, I'd do a flip, and when I hit the ground, the lights would go off, and that was the end of it. It was amazing. <laughs> it really was. It was. It was. It was quite a trip. I mean, we had. And it was a, big, a big concerts. Time. It was so big you couldn't even see the audience. It was so bright. It was just yeah. huge, huge, yeah. huge well, I concerts. We, I think you guys. I think, like I said earlier, I think that you guys were a, a little ahead of your time. Had, had it lasted a little bit longer, I think. You guys probably would have exploded. I mean, big time, really big time, because of the, you know the, the show you were putting on was fantastic. Yeah, but course, Star you know, was, Star had to go off on her own, so that was the end of that. But that's okay. Life goes on. Yeah. Life goes on. Now, how did you meet Shel Silverstein? He's the most amazing okay, person in the world. That's an interesting story. Uh, Shell meeting Shell probably changed my life forever, uh, and. Uh, Changed his to some degree as well. I had been living in Mexico. This goes back to 1960, about 1960. And I had been living in Mexico City. And I had come back to New York, and I was living in the village, and I didn't know anybody, and I couldn't do anything. I didn't know how to do anything. And how old I, were you? I was about, I think I was 21, maybe. <laughs> but Shel, Baby. Shel, I, think, I think Shell was 28. Uh, at that time. But anyway, Shell was a big deal in Greenwich Village because he was already working with Playboy and he was, uh, uh, you know, doing his children's books. He did. So he was he was a, a character and he was one of the main, uh, uh, he was one of the main characters in Greenwich Village at that time. Well, what happened was I, I, I was low man on the totem pole and I was wandering around the village just trying to find a place to do something, you know, and uh, but I had a car I had an advantage. It was a beat-up old Chevy. And I met this guy, Bill, who uh, was also a, a village character. And because I had this car, he said to me one day, he said, why don't we go on up to this, uh, up to Boston, uh, to Provincetown, actually. And he said, I've got two girls, and we can go up for the weekend, and, you know, we can use your car. So I said, well, sure, why not? Well, we were headed up 7th Avenue and on our way out of town, and all of a sudden, Bill says, there's Shell. Shell was walking down the street on 7th Avenue. And he said, let's see if he wants to go. The last thing in the world I wanted was for Shell Silverstein to get in the car and go up to Provincetown with us because I didn't need the competition of <laughs> Shell Silverstein and these two girls and Bill. I figured I knew that I was going to be in trouble because I was the low man, okay? Well, we, but, but I, I was following instructions, so I pulled up alongside Shell, and Bill said, you know, leans out the window and says, hey, Shell, he said, come on, why don't you come with us? We're going up to Provincetown, and uh, we're going to go on. We're going to go for the weekend. Why don't you come on? And Shell, with that voice of his, he says, and very arbitrarily, he says, nah, I don't want to go, right? Now, at that point, I'm very happy. Now I figure, well, he's not going to come. So now the two girls and Bill and myself will be gone for the weekend. So anyway, I make the mistake of leaning out and saying to Shell, because Bill was still trying to convince him, so I leaned out the window and I said, hey, look, uh, all we're going to do is we're just going to go up there. We're going to lie on the beach for a couple of days real quiet. Uh, Nothing's going to happen. So that'll be that, you know. At that point, Shell says, that sounds great. I'm going. He said, Take me back to my apartment. <laughs> okay. So here I am now, highly disappointed. I drive him to 428 Hudson Street, which is where his apartment was. And uh, that apartment I eventually took over many years later. But anyway, he gets out of the car and he runs up. It, it was a walk up. And he goes up to his apartment. We're sitting in the car. And one minute later, he comes down. And in one hand, he's got a bathing suit. And on the other hand, he's got a box of Ritz crackers. That's all he had. I, I fell in love with this guy instantly, right? I said, this is a trip. Anyway, he jumped in the back seat of the car with the two girls. And, of course, I didn't see any of those girls for the rest of the weekend. And, but for some reason, Shell befriended me. And it was probably the most important. You know, as life you, you said earlier, George, how life rolls on. It was probably the most important uh, move, both personally 
and professionally that ever happened besides my meeting my wife uh, was that encounter with Shell. And Shell and I uh, became very, very, very close friends. He was my closest friend for his entire life from that point on, except for a period of time uh, where I got mad at him about something and I refused to talk to him. Uh, and then uh, there'll be... Uh, we hooked back up, but sadly, it was a month before he died. He called me, and uh, he was up at Martha's Vineyard, and he was headed down to Key West. And I was going to follow him down uh, and meet him down there, but uh, sadly, he died between that uh, that period of time. But the so how did you start working with him and producing his, his uh, okay, songs? Okay, what happened was this. I had, a friend, I, I had a friend who worked at Mercury Records. It was... Uh, uh, MRC Music. It was a publishing company, and it was Mercury's publishing company. And my friend's name was Joel Diamond, and Tommy Matola, who you know became CEO of Sony eventually, and uh, mm-hmm. you probably know that name. Tommy worked for Joel. He, Tommy was a song plugger, and we all hung around at MRC. Jimmy Hendrix used to hang up, to hang around up there. We were all hanging around, right? And uh, Joel let me use the studio. So Shell would write songs, and he'd ask me to go into the studio with him and just do quick demos with him. I, by that time, had started to learn a little bit about <coughs> about music and, and, you know, making records and so on. So uh, Shell and I would go on up there and, uh, and record some of the songs that he would be doing, and that's how we originally started uh, of working together. That was about nine years before uh, I ever met Doctor Hook. This goes back wow. long before. This, this goes back long before Doctor Hook. And Shell and I. Uh, what was interesting was I wasn't doing very much. Shell was working for Playboy, so Shell would be traveling all over the world. And when he would be on his way back uh, from doing a trip for Playboy, you know, Silverstein in Hong Kong or Silverstein in Moscow or wherever, he would draw his cartoons on the plane coming back, and then he would have nothing to do. So we would spend days on end together from early morning. We would go out and have breakfast, then we would hang out, we would go have lunch together, then we it, it, at night we would go to the Café Wa, and, uh, which was... It, uh, you know, folk uh, place back in those days uh, where everybody played. We'd hang out there. So we spent an enormous amount of time together, and that went on for years. Uh, and it was, uh, it, and as time went on, uh, the relationship uh, became uh, a very close one. And uh, Shell was a fascinating character in this regard. Shell lived in a lot of different worlds. Nashville was one of them. Chicago and the theater was another one. He and David Mamet were friends, uh, the, the playwright. Uh, Shell, of course, Greenwich Village was another place. Sausalito was another place. And every the Playboy place Club. That he, he didn't spend a whole lot of time at the club. He spent a lot of time at the Playboy Mansion. As a matter of fact, he lived half a year, uh, half a year every year, at the Playboy Mansion. Both boy, wasn't he a Chicago. lucky boy? <laughs> oh, yes, he was. And he, uh, <laughs> this was both in Chicago, and then when Hess moved the Playboy Mansion to California, uh, Shell would stay there about half the year. He stayed in a room called the Red Room, was Shell's room, and that's where he lived. Uh, so, 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 how did you hook up with uh, Dr. Hook? Okay, what happened there was, Shell was doing the songs to a movie called Who is Harry Kellerman and Why is He Saying Those Terrible Things About Me? And it starred Dustin Hoffman. And Shell and I were walking down the street one day. Shell was going to be headed out to California. And he knew that I was very protective of his songs and his creativity. So, So what he said to me, he said, look, he said, I'm going to be in California. Do you think that you would produce the soundtrack for this album, for this movie with Dustin Hoffman. And we were walking down the street when he asked me that. I was broke. So the first words that came out of my mouth were, well, what are they going to pay me? And Shell looked at me and without missing a beat, he said, well, probably nothing. 
And I started, <laughs> what do you mean, probably nothing? I, I'm broke. I got it. I got it. And then I realized, I said, what am I doing? I said, this is a movie with Dustin Hoffman. I, I should be paying them. <laughs> so I said to Shell, I said, forget it. I didn't mean it. I'll do it. And that's how that all began. So what happened was I found a group. The people who were doing the movie wanted me to use a group like Simon and Garfunkel or because they had done uh, uh, what he called it, The Graduate. They wanted me to use a really well-known group. And I heard these guys playing in a bar in New Jersey, a place called The Sands. And I heard them play. And I thought to myself, these are the guys I want to use in this film. So I went back to the people who were doing the film, to Dustin, to Shell, to everybody. And I said, I found this group. They're playing for $4 a, a, a night a man. And they're playing a funky little bar in New Jersey. But I want to use them in the movie to do the title song, right? Everybody looked at me like I was crazy. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I will teach them the title song, which was called Last Morning. I said, and I will pay. I'll dig up the money, and I will pay for a demo session. But I want everybody there. I want Dust there. I want Shell there. I said, everybody's got to be there. If I pull it off, I want to use these guys in the film. So sure enough, I did a demo session. Uh, Marlo Thomas came. Uh, Dustin, of course, was there. Uh, Marlo was uh, dating her brother at the time, who was the guy who wrote the movie. And I... Uh, and the band pulled off this demo, and everybody decided, okay, we'll let Hafkin use them in the film. And that began everything. And uh, and that was the beginning of the whole trip. You know, so how did you meet there. Chris Christopherson? Well, Chris, what happened was there was another film called Mick Kelly, starring Mick Jagger, and Shell had written the songs for that. And he asked me to do the soundtrack to that album, I mean, to that movie, and then the soundtrack album, which stuck, at, now, the song was sung by Waylon Jennings. I did not know who Waylon was. I had not been in the South. I had never been to Nashville. Uh, Waylon was not thrilled about being in New York, but he came up there to do the soundtrack to that album, to that movie. And uh, he and I started working on the songs that Shell had written for the movie Ned Kelly, right? Well, Shell said to me, he said, there's another guy coming up. He said, he's a friend of mine by the name of Chris Christopherson. He said, can he stay with you at uh, at your apartment, which was the apartment that I had taken over from Shell. And I said, well, sure. So he came up there. Uh, Waylon was there. Uh, Mickey Newberry was there. Uh, Tom Gent was there. Everybody was all hanging out. Newberry was playing at the bitter end in Greenwich Village. Chris was staying with me. Waylon and I got into a hassle while the, while we were doing the soundtrack, and we got into a battle. And Chris <laughs> jumped in because Waylon was Waylon was a rough character to deal with, and I guess I wasn't too easy either. But Chris was a but Chris was a sweetheart of a guy, and he sort of got in the middle and said, hey, why didn't everybody calm down? And we started to do the soundtrack album, uh, finish the songs for the album, not for the movie. We had Waylon already done all the songs for the movie. And now we were doing the soundtrack album. And uh, so Chris got in there and he said uh, uh, that he would do the songs or some of the songs on that soundtrack album. So I produced Chris doing that. And I think I told you at one point uh, that the New York Times called me up. Had, Chris was just beginning to happen with Help Me Make It Through the Night, but he hadn't exploded yet. He hadn't become a huge songwriter yet. Uh, that many people did not know about him, but he was beginning to happen. And the New York Times called me, and they said, we understand that you're in the studio with uh, a fellow by the name of Chris Christopher, some songwriter, and he's doing uh, some songs on a uh, for a film that Shel Silverstein wrote the songs for. It's all a long story. But anyway, uh, they asked me, I still have the article, so, uh, they asked me if I thought that Chris was going to become a star. And I said, if you're asking me whether or not I think Chris uh, is a singer uh, like, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know who you would do, who you would do. Uh, more like an opera singer, the way we think about singing. I said, no, Chris is an interpreter. I said, if I, if you 
you're asking me whether I think he's going to become a star, uh, yes, I do. He's got a charisma and a magic that is unbelievable. And I said not only that, but he writes songs the likes of which I've never heard in my life. And that's when I told you, George, when he sang, we were all sitting around the apartment, and Chris sang for the first time. He sang me and Bobby McGee. And uh, oh. this, was before, this was before Janice ever ever heard it. Uh, everybody was sitting around. Waylon was singing songs. Shell was singing songs. Newberry was singing songs. Chris sang me and Bobby McGee. And I almost fell on the floor. I couldn't believe uh-huh. how unbelievable it was. And, uh, and I was trying to find a group sing that song to record and I didn't find one luckily for Chris because Jed, obviously Janis Joplin did it and that was the end of that I mean, What I about Dylan? Concerned. Do you have any stories yeah. about Dylan? He's yeah. another yeah. great song about, yeah. Yeah. I love that two, yeah. two things about Dylan which were great One was Shell, myself, Fred Neal who wrote Everybody's Talking At Me if you remember from Midnight Cowboy Yeah I know uh, with, with mm-hmm. Down at the Cafe Walk which was the main, you know, everybody was hanging out at the one, everybody was playing there from time to time. And Fred Neal uh, uh, was doing a show down there. And we were all sitting around the table. Shell was there, and Freddie was there, and uh, I forget who else. And this kid comes walking in, and he's got a guitar, and he's got a harmonica. And he said to Fred, he said, uh, hey, Fred, uh, can I get up on stage and sing a couple of songs? And Fred said, well, sure, go ahead. And he gets up there, and we're sitting at a table, this kid gets up there, and he starts to sing, and he starts to play his harmonica. He finished the first song. I looked at Shell. Mm-hmm. Shell looked at me. Uh, we, all of us, I forget who else was at the table, were looking at each other, and uh, I said, I don't know what it was I just heard, but I've never heard anything like it in my life. I, I said, this is... We just are listening to something the likes of which none of us have ever heard, and we all agreed on that. Many years later, Shell, Dylan, and myself were sitting on Shell's houseboat in Sausalito, and Shell and Bob were singing each other's songs. It just went on for about an hour. I was sitting in the corner just listening, keeping my mouth shut, thinking I had died and gone to heaven. And these guys, <laughs> are, singing each, and these guys are singing each other's songs. This went on for about an hour, and i got to tell you something. Finally, Dylan looked over at Shell, and he said, Hey, Shell, man, you win. And what he meant was, Dylan, of course, knew what a great writer he himself was, but Shell kept coming up with these incredibly unique songs that were, you know, funny. They were this, they were that, and it was fantastic. It was one of the greatest experiences, musical experiences, of my entire life to have been uh, uh, able to have been part of, of listening to these two geniuses singing each other's songs. So, um, it was an incredible, incredible experience. Mm-hmm. How about the song mm-hmm. You're Only 16? How did that come about? Only 16? That was interesting. We had gone, Dr. Hook, we had had a couple of big hit records. One was Sylvia's Mother and the other was Cover Rolling Stone. And uh, and we were out on the road because Clive Davis wanted us out there on the road. So we were out uh, playing every, practically every single night. And it was costing us more money to stay out there than it was than we were making. So we were going broke. Well, finally, we did go broke. I was the only one. I had made some other deals, so I still had some money. So I paid you know, for the group to for their rents and all, all that stuff uh, for about six months. And uh, and we were nowhere. I mean, we, we were off the label, which is another long story, which I won't go into right now. But what happened was uh, I had a friend of mine who had a studio in Ojai, California, in, a, in an orange grove. And he said to me, he said, why don't you take the band in there and record something, and then you can go look for another label. Well, the studio, I said, what are you going to charge? He said, I'll charge you $5 an hour. I said, $5 an hour? You can't beat that, right? Well, Dennis, uh, one afternoon, as, as we were recording, Dennis sang Only 16. And his, and I heard it, and I said, man, I think we ought to record that. And I said, where'd you pick that up from? He said, my mother, it's one of my mother's favorite songs. So we recorded Only 16. We 
recorded a song called The Millionaire at the same time at, uh, at Studio Five Bucks an Hour. I eventually mm-hmm. ended up taking it over to Capitol Records. Al Corey was the president of Capitol Records at the time. He passed mm-hmm. away, I think, two weeks ago. And, uh, and I played him both tunes. And uh, he said, okay, because Hook had a name, all right? I mean, everybody knew who they were. Uh, and uh, he said, how much do you want? And I told him. And he said, well, that's uh, a little bit more than uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to spend. I'll have to talk to the board of directors about that. And he said, and he walked out the door, and he walked back in in five seconds. He said, they said yes. So there we were on Capitol. Now, I did not know, nor did the group, that that was the beginning of the biggest part of Dr. Hook's career. Because Dr. Hook lasted another 10 years, and uh, and we had a... Uh, uh, a lot of hits around the world. But, uh, but, How many gold uh, records did you get? In platinum well, records. Well, world, worldwide, sixty-seven gold and platinum albums. Uh-huh. Now, what what I've got to explain, of course, is that in certain countries, a gold record might have been four records because they might have had a population <laughs> of twenty people. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like here where a gold record was half a million. You know, or a platinum record was a, a million. In Norway, it was much less. In, in Denmark, it was much less. But still, 67 gold and platinum albums ain't, ain't small potatoes anyway. But uh-huh. uh, but it, it was interesting. There was something I wanted to tell you, George, uh, that, I, that I don't think I ever told you the story about. And it had to do with Sylvia's mother. Sylvia's mother, I- which was the, the first biggest hit. You want to hear about mm. that? Yes, your mother was named Sylvia, and so was uh, Shel Silverstein's mother, right? <laughs> yeah. No, 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 Syl- no. Sylvia, Sylvia was a girlfriend. It was a true story. I know, but, was, but your mother was named Sylvia, and so was his, was right? Sylvia. No, his but I know the song's got nothing to do with that. Go ahead. Yeah. But anyway, uh, what happened was uh, I had recorded this when we first got signed to Columbia to hear a few Clive Davis. Yeah, Clive we Davis. Cal- yeah, we had gone out to California, and I had cut 20 sides. We were living in a flop house because we didn't have any <laughs> money. Columbia had given us some money, but we had uh, gone to, uh, after we did the Columbia Convention, after the signing, we went up to Sausalito to see Shell, and, uh, but we didn't have any money. So we were staying on Geary Street in the flop house. And the rooms, I think, were like $2 a night or something like that. And I had a little wall and sack tape recorder, and we were recording at the Columbia Studios. And I had cut 20 sides, right? And I, and Clive was driving me crazy in order to get the first album because we had been recording for a long time. So Shell said, we're coming across the Golden Gate Bridge one night after recording, and Shell was in the uh, in my car. And he said, you need to hear this song. And I said, what song? And he plays me Sylvia's mother. And he said, you know, you should record that. And I said, Shell, I can't, man. I said, Clive is driving me crazy. He wants that album. I can't go back in and and, and take any more time. He said, so we get to the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge, and he said, listen to it again. (laughs) And, of course, I listened to it again. I said, it's great, man, but I can't do it. And then I thought to myself, I said, wait a minute. If Clyde wants to stop me, he's in New York. I'm in San Francisco. He's going to have to talk to his secretary. He's going to have to get a plane reservation. He's going to have to come out here. He's going to have to, you know, it's going to take him at least three days. By that time, I'll have the record done. So <laughs> I, decided, I decided to hell with it. I'm going in to record it. And we did. And we recorded the record. And if it had not been for that Sylvia's mother, I don't know if there would have been a Dr. Hook as we know Dr. Hook today. What an awesome... Didn't Clive... uh, Didn't uh, one of the (laughs) band members dance on top of uh, Clive's desk is how you got the contract in the first place? Dancing on his desk, the way we got the contract in the first place uh, Mm -hmm. came from the movie. I knew the the word was out that Dustin Hoffman was making a a new film. Uh, The word was out that there was a, a group uh, that was in that film, and I called Clive. I didn't know Clive, so I cold called him and uh, spoke to one of his representatives, and I said, uh, uh, 
told them who I was and you know we had that first bunch of Dustin Hoffman and Cheryl Silverstein and so on and so forth that we had the band in this movie and we would like to come and play for five and he said well we'll set up a showcase and I said I knew the band at that time was not really ready for a live uh, full blown showcase but I did know that with Dennis and Ray singing together three feet away from anybody would blow them through the wall, okay? Um, it's been a great, great afternoon, enriching, enriching stories. Girl, George, you rock the house with, with all your... Afternoon. You always make my Sunday afternoons. Ron Helfkin, oh, what a joy it was to have you on the show. If uh, there's anything that you probably would want to plug, you can do it now. <laughs> there what? I didn't hear that. <laughs> oh, if there's anything you want to plug? <laughs> No, no, no. I'm, I'm working now with, with uh, two acts. One is in Mexico, uh, mm-hmm. under name Brian James, and uh, he's they're quite incredible. And the other is uh, an act called Tawny River. But, uh, they're wonderful writers there in Nashville. And uh, oh. so I'm working with that. It, it, it's a lot of fun. I, I've always loved great songs, and uh, that's what I look for. I look for artists oh. that really uh, write interesting stuff that I haven't, uh, you know, quite yeah. heard before, you know, so uh, awesome. that's what I'm doing now. Awesome. Uh, it was um, good talking to you, Ron. We're all out yes. of time now. Yes, yes we it's, are. <laughs> it's great talking to you guys. Thanks a lot. It's uh, mm-hmm. a lot of fun. George, it's always great talking with you, and it's great talking with both of you. Oh, yeah. thank you so much. Yes. Thanks a lot, gonna... guys. Yes, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you uh, if you please, uh, right after the show, the show is going to be archived. You can take a listen into the archive section on Gypsy Poet Radio on blogtalkradio.com front slash Gypsy Poet. Girl George and I are signing off saying, uh, uh, Girl George, awesome, awesome show. And I'm just signing off saying, this is the Gypsy Poet signing off saying, adieu for now. Ciao. Everybody's crazy but me. Everybody's nutty as can be. Farming games, waging wars, paint the names upon the door. You against me, us versus them. No communicado, don't give a damn. Our kids in the street are the gross casualty now. Oh, just not easy, everybody.